Good evening. Good evening, and thank you all for being at this evening's program, which is our annual Riesmann Forum for Politics and Policy. And right at the start, let me say that all of us at Harvard Hillel are very grateful to the Mandel and Madeleine Berman Foundation, who sponsor our annual Riesmann Forum in memory of Robert Riesmann, who was so committed to Jewish life and thought at Harvard. Those of us who recall hosting the late Bill Berman Mandel of blessed memory, Zichrona Livracha, at these forum programs in their first iterations miss him very, very much. Um, I'm Jonah Steinberg. I am the director here. But most to the point uh, for this evening, I'm the guy who feels so blessed, and if a rabbi may confess it, really rather wise to have uh, hired the moderator uh, for this evening's conversation as a member of our Harvard Hillel team. Uh, yes. <laughs> Lauren Cohen Fisher is our IACT Director of Israel Programming, and in saying IACT, I must give thanks to, uh, very sincere thanks to Combined Jewish Philanthropies uh, with whom we partner. And uh, Lauren holds an MA in political science with a focus on security policy and diplomacy from Tel Aviv University. Uh, and even more relevant to this evening is just back from leading a large group of our students on our uh, winter birthright trip and its trextension. And I, I will tell you just briefly what a trextension is uh, and take the moment to do that only because it really bears on tonight's conversation. The best people to testify about it, I think, are smiling in some of the first few rows because they're just back from experiencing it. So to explain to you what a trextension is, I first have to explain what a trek is. Uh, about six years back, some of our own Israeli students came up with the idea of uh, taking 50 of their mostly non-Jewish Harvard peers to Israel over the spring break. Um, with an itinerary for that trip, which we also designed really in close consultation with CJP, in which we traded shamelessly and continue to trade shamelessly on the, on the name of this august university to open doors uh, for the participants, uh, the likes of which um, are, are really quite remarkable. This trip, does, I, I tagged along this past March, and, and I can tell you, this, was, this is not wasting anybody's time. They meet with uh, members of parliament. They meet with Supreme Court justices. They meet with negotiators, both, uh, both Palestinian and Israeli. They meet with journalists. They spend time with Haredi community and women of the wall. And you know, in, in the same hour, they can hear from Naftali Bennett on the one hand, and Ayman Udeh of the Arab Joint List on the the other. And if that's not enough to, to get people coming back saying, wow, it's complicated over there. But the truth is when they return saying that, that is hundreds of times better than thinking they know it is some particular way. Um, and that's the, that's the experience we realized our students going on birthright trips were somehow um, you know, with all respect for the birthright program, which has done so much, frankly, our non-Jewish Trek students were getting the superior itinerary. And so um, with Lauren in, in the lead, we, we designed a five-day uh, extension to our birthright program under the tagline, stay for five more days and go deeper, uh, opening some of the same doors, exploring some of the same questions, spending time with some of the same sectors of, uh, of Israeli society. And as I said to the Trek participants just across the, the building uh, earlier this week, you know, one hears about multiple narratives, but what a trip like this enables one to do is to encounter the lives that correspond to these narratives, to get to know the people, because these <coughs> narratives exist because of the lives and experiences of people. And why I'm so proud that we do this is that it respects the intelligence of our Harvard students. Uh, and I can testify from my point of view as a Hillel director that when students return from this head-spinning experience, they lean in. They don't, they don't run away. Um, they now know what the issues are, have encountered them firsthand, uh, and, have, and have the inclination to, um, to stay connected. Um, and I really want to give thanks to, to Lauren, who is, the, who is the key professional on the front lines of this. Um, and uh, I will leave it to, uh, to Lauren to say more who's going to moderate the program, but I also want to introduce two of our students uh, very involved in the Israel space, both Samantha Frankel-Popel and Jacob Fortinsky, 
uh, of the, both of the class of uh, 2021 who will introduce our speakers for the evening, to whom I also want to extend uh, very sincere gratitude for your being here, Danny, Peter. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it is my distinct honor to welcome you all to the annual Reisman Forum for Israeli Politics and Policy. My name is Jacob Fortinsky. I'm the Vice President here at Harvard Hillel for Community Relations. Uh, I've been involved in planning Israel programs for several years now, and I don't think I've ever been as excited as I, as I am currently for an event. Um, Dr. Gordis and Mr. Beinart, Mr. Beinart are two of the most respected and brilliant writers and public intellectuals when it comes to American Jewry and Israel. Whenever I read anything of theirs on Israel or anything else, I'm I am blown away by how captiv captivating, insightful, and often very challenging their ideas are. Over the last few years, my dad and I, not unlike many um, parents and children, have had an ongoing debate about Israeli politics. Um, and we frequently um, cite um, the two speakers here. Usually I'm uh, quoting Beinart, and usually he's quoting Gordis. Um, <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> um, but al although not exclusively. And, um, and, and last year, my Saba and I actually read uh, The Crisis of Zionism together, which was um, a profoundly moving experience. Um, and I've had the opportunity to hear them both before. And tonight's just going to be uh, an amazing event. Um, about a few weeks ago, my dad actually um, sent me the article that um, Dr. Gordis wrote for the Times of Israel, um, in part refuting um, some of what um, Peter has said. Um, <laughs> and in it, um, uh, Dr. Gordis mentioned that they're coming uh, to speak tonight, and he said, he said to me, oh, you know, it's such a privilege you go to Harvard and you get to go to an event like that, not knowing that I was, you know, partly planning it and <laughs> introducing them. And I told them, and, you know, he's very excited, and hopefully he's watching on the live stream. Um, anyway, um, so with that, um, I, I'm excited to, uh, to join you all for an amazing conversation tonight. So just to give a little bit of background about these two, um, Dr. Daniel Gordis is a senior vice president and quite distinguished fellow at Shalem College. He's the author of more than 10 books and a regular columnist for Bloomberg. His most recent book is A History of the State of Israel, entitled Israel, A Concise History of a Nation Reborn, which received the 2016 National Jewish Book Award as Book of the Year. When Ambassador Dennis Ross was reflecting on the book, he wrote, when I'm asked, is there one book to read about Israel, I now have an answer. Professor Alan Dershowitz has called Gordis one of Israel's most thoughtful observers. The Forward has called him one of the most respected Israel analysts around. In 2014, the Jerusalem Post listed him as one of the world's 50 most influential Jews, while Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic has written, if you ask me, of all the people you know, who cares the most about the physical, moral, and spiritual health of Israel, I would put the commentator and scholar Daniel Gordis at the top of the list. Gordis's next book on American Jews and their relationship to Israel, titled We Stand Divided, will be published in September. Peter Beinart is the professor of journalism and political science at the City University of New York. He is also a contributor to The Atlantic, a senior columnist at The Forward, a CNN political commentator, and a fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. His first book, The Good Fight, was published by HarperCollins in 2006. His second book, The Icarus Syndrome, was also published by HarperCollins in 2010. And his third, The Crisis of Zionism, was published by Times Books in 2012. Beinart has written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the Boston Globe, the Atlantic, Newsweek, Slate, and Reader's Digest. The Week magazine named him columnist of the year in 2004, and in 2005, he gave the Theodore H. White lecture at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He has appeared on This Week with George Stephanopoulos, Charlie Rose, Meet the Press, The Colbert Report, and many other television programs. Beinart graduated from Yale University, winning a Rhodes Scholarship for graduate study at Oxford. After graduating from University College Oxford, Beinart became the New Republic's managing editor in 1995. He became senior editor in 1997, and from 1999 to 2006, served as the magazine's editor. So please join me in welcoming them. All right, we ready to have some fun? Okay. 
Um, well, first and foremost, we forgive you about Yale. Um, I'm sorry to hear it, but we welcome you here nonetheless. So to set a little bit of a framing for tonight, as probably many of you know and have experienced, we are living right now in an increasingly polarized world, not only in the American Jewish community, but also in our American and global communities writ large. And so our goal tonight is not only to unpack a discourse across the political spectrum, but also to model for our students, for the Harvard community, and for our Cambridge Somerville community writ large, what it looks like to remain engaged in deep and meaningful conversation with those with whom we disagree. The way that we're gonna run tonight is we will have a discussion for roughly 40 minutes. Uh, for those of you who are new to the building, if for any reason you need a bathroom, there's one behind you and also downstairs, welcome, we are so happy you're here. If you are not new to the building, thank you so much for coming again, we're so happy to see you. Uh, if you need anything, there are a few Harvard Hill staff members scattered throughout the audience and please feel free to ask them. We would love for you to feel comfortable and at home here in our space. After that, we'll open up the floor for some questions and we'll hear a little bit about the thoughts and ideas that are going on uh, in this wonderful room that we have. So without further ado, I'd love to start us off maybe with a, with a bit of an open-ended question, which is that a lot of people right now are talking about this large rift that is happening between the Jewish American and Jewish Israeli communities. And I'm curious in both or either of your perspectives, if you feel like uh, that is an accurate description that we have this growing rift right now. If yes, what's causing it? If no, why is it getting exaggerated in our current media? Um, where are we, where are we going and where have we been? Maybe we can start with that and then narrow in on, uh, on some more specific thoughts and ideas. Okay. Danny's just written a book on this. The subject, so maybe he should. <laughs> I'll go quick. Um, <laughs> I do think that the rift is getting wider. Um, it's not that the rift didn't exist before, but the rift, I think, is getting wider and more pronounced. And I'm sure that over the course of the evening, we can explore more both the evidence for that or against it uh, and talk a little bit about why it may be. But I'll just give you one example, I think, to give you a sense of especially among younger American Jews. What's after millennials? Gen Z, 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 whatever. Yeah, run out of letters. Z plus. Yeah, no, I, I, somebody, I think it's Gen Z, Z actually, plus? at this point, yeah, for, Z for plus, really young. And I'm like, I want to know what comes next. They go back to A or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, um, one, just one indication. I think the first time that you and I had this kind of a conversation, which was at Columbia, mm -hmm. which didn't get dissed like Yale did, I just want to say. But in any event, um, <laughs> the first time we did this, the, the hot conversation was about J Street back right. in the day. Right. And the question really was, is J Street in the tent or is J Street not in the tent? Okay. J Street is the pillar holding up the middle of the tent. That's what it is. And the conversation today, let's forget tent, out of tent, in tent, uh, the most interesting new phenomenon in the scene now is, if not now, which is decidedly and specifically unwilling to state that it favors a sovereign Jewish state. That was never the case with J Street. Um, we, were not, you know, dis we didn't agree about J Street, but we agreed completely that it was formally and I think in, in practice in favor of Jewish sovereign state. So the mere fact that in, I don't know, whatever, it's been you know, five, six, seven years since we first had that conversation, uh, J Street has moved from, is it in the tent, to the pillar of the tent, I think says a tremendous amount about where the American Jewish community uh, has gone. The other possible indication of how not only the rift is widening, but how people are willing to acknowledge the depth of the rift is the change of what's, ha with what's happened with Jewish Voice for Peace, even in the last few weeks. For years already, everybody from the ADL to the AJC to many others have been saying that they perceived JVP, as it's commonly called, as being an anti-Israel organization, clothed in the clothing of something that was a little bit different. Again, reasonable minds could differ about that, at least so some said. Uh, <laughs> but they've actually come out and said explicitly that they are actually also not in favor of the existence of a Jewish state. So I just think those are, those are small little indications of the ways in which I think that the rift has become more pronounced and that people are less abashed about expressing the fact that there is this rift. I think most of the conversation tonight probably, or a large part of it, will be about uh, what's really causing this rift if it's getting wider, what the root of the rift is even if it's not getting wider, why we have this divide. And one of the things that I'll just say at the outset, I think that one of the things that makes the conversation um, interesting with me and Peter is that we actually more or less want the same thing at the end of the day. I mean, that, I think our, 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 our debate or our deliberations are about how to get to something that we both want, which is peace in the Middle East, which is a strong and stable sovereign Jewish state, which is a strong, stable, democratic Palestinian state next to it, 
Um, I think, still there? Is that, yeah. is you didn't mention sovereign. <laughs> I, I noticed you didn't mention sovereign for the Palestinian so, state. Well, state means sovereign. But okay. yes, sovereign Palestinian <laughs> state. You feeling better? OK. But you're still there, right? That's still yes, more or less your yes, opinion? Yes. So we basically agree about that. I yeah. think our disagreement is about how to get there. Having said that, and we'll probably disagree about why we're not there yet, I think it's really very important, and this, without, this I'll end, that this rift is not new. The non-rift is the exception. There was a. There was a little honeymoon, but it came long after the marriage. Uh, the honeymoon really was between 67, for reasons we can go into, to I would say probably 82, around give or take Sabra and Shatila. Again, those are somewhat arbitrary moments, but 67 is not arbitrary. Sabra and Shatila is more arbitrary. But it's important to remember that in 1921, Louis Brandeis and Chaim Weitzman had a huge blow up over where the direction that Zionism should take. And um, Weitzman flew to Chicago and was able to push Brandeis out of the Zionist movement. And it was about a fundamental disagreement between Europeans and Americans long before the state of what Zionism should try to accomplish. Uh, when the Blaustein Ben Gurion blow up happened in 1948, 49, 50, resulting in the Blaustein Ben Gurion agreement, um, that was also about a fundamental American Jewish discomfort with the idea of a Jewish state and the idea that the Jews in that state would think of themselves as the center of the Jewish world, which they did then, by the way, even though there were only 600,000 of them, and they certainly do now, now that there's 8 million of them. Uh, the other example is that when Israel captured Eichmann, there was not celebration in Israel, that's the wrong word to use, but there was a deep sense of satisfaction that sovereign, Jewish sovereignty meant that you could no longer, with impunity, slaughter Jews and then live out your life somewhere. Um, in America, Jews reacted with horror to the capture of Eichmann. First of all, there was the equivalent of a misamcha, the, 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 the conversation of the, between the taskmaster and Moses, who appointed you. In other words, the point was, Eichmann didn't kill any Israelis. He killed Jews. So by virtue of what do you see yourselves as the people who should go nab him? You know, as if the B'nai B'rith with logistical support from Hadassah was going to go get him. <laughs> but right, but leaving, that, leaving that aside, right, leaving that aside, um, that, was, that was a powerful thing. And Joseph Proskauer, Joseph Proskauer and Eric Fromm and many others argued, and they said this very explicitly, that what Israel had done to Eichmann, this is what they said, was no, wor was no better than what Eichmann had done to the Jews. Those were their words. That was 1960. It's 1960. So there was a very long period in which American Jews and Israel had fundamental differences about the importance or even the legitimacy of Jewish statehood. That, I think, is actually the default. I think the exception to that period was 67 to 82. And we're now, ironically, sliding right back to where we were in 21 and 48 and 60. Um, well, first of all, I, unlike Danny, would not put anything past Adassa. I mean, I think they, given their ability to track... Well, my issue was B'nai B'rith. Uh, B'nai B'rith. <laughs> given their ability to track people down in my family for fundraising contributions, I... I uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, we're off to a, a bad start because I, I really agree with pretty much everything that Danny said. Um, I'll try to make that, this the last time. Um, um, you look, first of all, Zionism is, is built, you know, in, in many ways on the rejection of the idea that diaspora... Jewish identity is a good way to live your life, right? And American Jews, maybe more than any diaspora community around the world, are emphatic in the belief that basically to be an American Jew is the best kind of Jew you could be, right? And America is the best place to be a Jew, right? And so you've got a very deep kind of fit, fundamental clash there. You also have, I think, the, if you think about the places that Israeli and American Jews come from, right? Israel comes out of the experience of European Jews and Mizrahi Jews, right? It, unlike the United States, is a very large percentage of Jews who come from North Africa, the Middle East, right? Um, and um, so that's a, a, a tradition, right? I say this is someone whose you know, uh, grandmother was born in Egypt. That's a tradition that American Jews don't have a lot of connection to, right? So that's a whole aspect of Israeli Jewish culture that most uh, American Jews who kind of take Ashkenazi Judaism as the only Judaism they have any experience with don't have a lot of experience, in, experience with. Interestingly, I think if you looked at Mizrahi Jews in the United States and Mizrahi Jews in Israel, right? if you looked at the Syrian community in Brooklyn and New Jersey and the Persian community in LA and Long Island, you would actually find that they are not as divergent as the Ashkenazi populations in two places. right? Um, uh, they both love Donald Trump. 
right? Um, and Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, um, but um, on the Ashkenazi side, right, which is where almost all American Jews are from, you have this distancing from the European heritage in both places, right? American Jews becoming more American, Israeli Jews becoming more Israeli. I think Levi Eshkol used to say, right, that when the American Jewish leaders used to come to Israel, he would talk Yiddish to them, right? Well, unless they're Haredim coming from Brooklyn to Israel, nobody's speaking Yiddish with anybody anymore, right? So there's been this kind of distancing, and what that's, you know, from the common European heritage. And what that's meant, in the case of American Jews, is um, the extremely powerful tide of assimilation, um, which has made, you know, Danny talks, I think, and I think it's a good a dichotomy about tribalism and universalism. Um, and I think, um, and, and what's happened is that American Jews in fact, I say American Jews, but it's really would be more accurate to call most of them Jewish Americans because their Americanness is more central to their identity than their Jewishness, which is to say, could you, if you ask them, could you more easily imagine yourself as a Gentile in the United States or a Jew in Australia? I think the, the American Jewish leadership would say, I'm, you know, put me on the plane to Sydney. But the, but the mass of American Jews would say, I would actually feel more comfortable as an American Gentile. So this force of assimilation becoming more completely American, right, has been, a force, has been a force of distancing and also has made it harder to defend a national, in, 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 um, among American Jews, a na younger in particular, a nationalist project which is explicitly about privileging Jews and their security and their identity, their public representation over other people. I mean, how exactly you manage that is, is something you can debate about, but there's no question that Israel has a special obligation to represent and protect its, its Jewish population and even the Jewish population around the world, which is a kind of tribal assertion, an assertion of peoplehood, not an assertion of universalism, even, of course, even though, of course, there are universal elements in the Zionist movement as well. Um, I think a couple of other uh, differences are that um, one of the things that linked American Jews to Israel was the notion of refuge. The notion that it was a really good thing to have a Jewish state around because you might need it, right? That, um, and I think it's that view, if you look about at the debates in the United States about the Lebanon War or the First Intifada, which were very, very passionate. I mean, one of my heroes growing up was Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg, right? A, a f fierce critic of Israeli policy in the 1980s. But I think even the fiercest critics in the 1980s, by and large, didn't challenge the notion of the existence of Jewish statehood. And I think part of it was because the notion that you needed a Jewish state so that Jews in the diaspora, and including Jews in the United States, would have it as a, as a refuge, as a place to go. I mean, that's what made American Jews really move en masse to Zionism in the first place, in the middle of the 20th century, in the 30s and 40s, the sense that regardless of what you thought about the theology and the ideology, that the, that the Holocaust and the fact that the world's nations had not opened their doors to Jews uh, on the brink of, 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 of extermination showed that you needed a Jewish state. I think younger American Jews, because of their own life experience, and because of the history they've seen in the world. I mean, I came of age with the Soviet exodus of Jews and with the Ethiopian exodus of Jews. You know, that sense of Jews being under state-sponsored anti-Semitic persecution and coming to Israel to be safe. Millennials have not seen that large-scale exodus. Um, and I think that's had an impact on to the degree to which they're willing to say, look, if I fundamentally disagree with what Israel does, I'm more willing to ask fundamental questions about what Israel is than, than older generations. Um, and the last, uh, obviously in Israel there's been change, right? You have a larger Dati and Haredi, right? Kind of modern Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox population, which has pushed the country to the right. Uh, politically, among other factors that have pushed it to the right, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, and then the other thing, which I think one can't not discuss, is the demise of the two-state solution, right? In the sense that um, if American Jews were trying to find some balance between tribalism and universalism, between, you know, um, the two-state solution offered the prospect of a Jewish state that would not be... Uh, not be exercising control over millions of Palestinians in the West Bank who lack basic rights, who lack citizenship uh, under the control, un, you know, in basically who, who live under Israeli control, but without citizenship, without the right to vote, under military law, without free movement. And as the two-state solution has become, has moved closer and closer to death, um, American Jews have essentially been asked to choose between two species of one-state solution. Um, and I don't think it's entirely surprising that a community with liberal universalistic values, even if it might have been open to the two-state solution, that, that the younger generation of which, and you see this with a group like If Not Now, is essentially saying if the choice is between some kind of secular binational state 
um, and Israel, which, occupy, which has permanent control over millions of people who lack basic rights, I will roll the dice on a secular binational state. That's not my view, but I think that if, we want, if we're concerned about that, as Danny is and I am, we, the people who have contributed to killing the two-state solution, and I particularly think of the Israeli government and the American Jewish establishment, who I think have played a very large role in, that, in the destruction of the two-state solution. The Palestinians have played a role too, but the, but the Israeli government and the American Jewish community have, made, have basically massively subsidized settlement growth and created the political will situation in the United States where it can't be opposed in Washington. That is part of the reason that you're seeing this move towards more openness to anti-Zionist or non-Zionist alternatives. There's a lot there. All right. Um, for anyone who missed or didn't understand one of the dates, names, events uh, that, was, that was mentioned in the last little bit, uh, shameless plug for my office downstairs, which has a lot of books on a lot of these things, please make sure to come and check in with me. We have some degree of uh, an appendix of what all of these things mean and what they refer to. So if you were a little lost, totally don't worry. And one of the things that I'm hearing a little bit out of what you're both saying is that Peter, you're talking a little bit about a generational divide and also a lot about the, the political consequences of where Israel is moving with regards to the Palestinian question. And Daniel, it seems like you're talking a little bit about the way that this rift has kind of always existed as a thread that's tracing throughout the trajectory of the Jewish-American, Jewish-Israeli relationship. And at this moment, we're focusing in on something that maybe seems a little bigger. And for those of you out there who don't have a Google alert for uh, Peter Beiner or Daniel Gordis that comes to your email every morning like I do. Shame uh, on you. <laughs> uh, you may have missed two op-eds that came out fairly recently. Um, one in which uh, Peter writes that it is dishonest and immoral not to take groups of American Jews visiting Israel to hear from Palestinians who live under Israeli control. And then a very large rebuttal of that from Daniel. Um, and one of the things that came out of that for me was that it seems like you two both have a fundamentally different understanding of what the relationship between the American Jewish community and the Israeli story or the Israeli Jewish community should be. And um, we talked about this a little bit uh, before, and I'm wondering if maybe you can share that uh, with the community here, because I think that that's a really interesting foundational difference that you have, and maybe we'll help illuminate a little bit of the conversation in terms of where your differences lie. Uh, though it was very nice for you to name that you do seem to have one agreement, so that was a good way to start the conversation. Uh, do you want me to start? Or whatever. Go for it. Um, um, let me just start with the birthright point. You know, um, I, like Danny, um, worry a lot about the thinning of American Jewish identity, especially in the younger generation. I feel like we are uh, among American Jews conducting a kind of mass experiment in what happens in a society when radical ignorance meets radical acceptance. Um, kind of, uh, even notwithstanding some rise in anti-Semitism, I think there's still a kind of radical acceptance of Jews in the United States. Um, uh, which is, uh, and, and yet in the American Jewish community, we're maybe the, the, the largest and kind of most ignorant America, uh, Jew, world Jewish community maybe that's ever existed. You know? um, um, and so what happens under those circumstances is that um, people's Jewish identity dwindles and dwindles until it kind of becomes that the, you know, the Italians have eggplant parmesan and the Jews have bagels and lox, right? Um, uh, which to me is, is, is tragic. It's not tragic for me because I believe that we should be telling people who they should marry or that because there's anything wrong with marrying the person you love, not at all. It's because I feel like the organized American Jewish community has not really equipped, in many cases, younger American Jews to even make an informed decision. Essentially, they've not even been educated to understand what it is that they're giving up, what it is that they're not perpetuating because they haven't been educated, right? And we have a community that has often been more comfortable spending money on Holocaust memorials than on Jewish schools, you know? Um, and, um, you know, where Jewish schools are often, um, and I say this as the parent of two kids who go to a good Jewish school, uh, uh, but, you know, Jewish schools are often academically mediocre and unbelievably expensive um, when we know that Jewish schooling and Jewish camp are the most important thing in terms of providing people the kind of found Jewish foundation that will lead them to um, to create a Jewish family in the next generation. So in that regard, I like birthright. I mean, it wouldn't be, I, I, I could think of ways I would use the money differently, but I, I like the idea a lot 
of having young American Jewish kids go to Israel because I do think it can be a very, very powerful experience. It was a powerful experience for me as a kid. It's a powerful experience for my kids. It's still a powerful experience for me, a very, 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 very powerful experience. Um, but I don't see that as exclusive in any way of, 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 of the fact that you, of, of interacting while you're in Israel with some part of the 50% of the people between the river and the sea who are Palestinian, right? It seems to me it's not only because you should want to understand Palestinians, it's because you can't understand Israel without understanding Palestinians, right? Um, uh, the 20% of Israel's population are Palestinian citizens, right? We tend to be called Arab Israelis in the American Jewish community, but they really mostly define themselves now as Palestinians. And, and, and not to mention the, the millions of Palestinians in the, in the West Bank. So it seems to be that if you want to understand, and, and this, if you want to understand Israel and you don't interact with Palestinians to a certain degree, especially given that you're inevitably going to be talking about Palestinians, right? You can't go to Israel on a birth trip and not end up talking about Palestinians, right? So you end up talking about Palestinians, but not with Palestinians, which to me is always a recipe for dehumanization when you talk about people, but not with people, right? If we were to imagine a, a, tri a tour of, you know, uh, you know, you know, Europeans to come to do a tour to understand the United States and spend a lot of time talking about race relations in the United States and spending all their time on the Upper West Side and Upper East Side of New York and never going to the Bronx, right? We would say that's not actually a very good way of understanding the United States. Um, so that's why I think it's crucially important to, to meet with Palestinians. And I think actually we have really now really great models in the American Jewish community of institutions that are doing that. For instance, Encounter um, uh, has, t as, you know, is an organization that I really love, takes lots of American Jewish leaders, not necessarily lefties, a lot of people who are pretty conservative politically. And what's, what's striking about their, what they say is they very often say, first of all, I learned a tremendous amount, but they also say, I understand Israel better. You know, I understand Israel better. So I think it's wonderful that Harvard is doing this. I understand, and Danny you know, pointed this out in his critique of a piece, that there are logistical challenges. Maybe Sheldon Adelson wouldn't be so thrilled about it. Um, and um, you know, uh, maybe, I don't know, we should, I, I'm, I'd be willing to take that risk. I think you know, then, you, then, if, then it should be that people who have different values than Sheldon Adelson, people who actually believe in liberal democracy, people who have not called up for dropping an atomic bomb on Iran, should be willing to step up and put their money where their mouth is and, and, and make up for that money. Um, uh, and, if Sheldon, and, um, uh, and I also think that you know, there are questions about which Palestinians you meet with, but in some ways the whole point is that Palestinians are not monolithic. So if you meet with Palestinians who have a whole different set of views, some of whom say they could live alongside Israel as a Jewish state, some of whom say they would never live alongside it, some of whom want a secular binational state, some of whom want an Islamic state, um, that would be good. Right? Uh, in the sense that that would create a more complex and more humanized vision of these people that we obsess about all the time and yet often in the American Jewish community have very little interaction with. I would be um, shocked if you didn't want to disagree a little bit. <clears throat> I don't want to, but I have to. <laughs> um, so I think this is, I actually agree with a large part of that, but I think this is about to end. Um, look, I, I want to zoom out here and talk a little bit about what I think the the whole brouhaha about, about birthright is. I think we both agree that birthright's a good, it's a good idea, mm -hmm. and it's great to bring tens of thousands of young Jewish people to Israel. Uh, the percentage of people between, I don't know, 20 and now 40, because birthright's been around a lot, who have been to Israel is infinitely higher than the percentage of Jews, let's say, between 50 and 80, who've been to America, it's about 30%, and it's much higher. It's more than half, I think, now about, uh, um, in the younger generation. That's a fantastic idea. But I want to take a step back from, from birthright and see birthright in the context of a larger dynamic that's happening. And I will say I think that actually you've been at the forefront of this dynamic beginning with your New York Review of Books article, which is this idea that the American Jewish establishment is fundamentally guilty in perpetuating the conflict and that the enemy of good is the American Jewish establishment which I'm not part of, so I mean, I don't have to, I'm not trying to defend something of which I'm a part, and I think there's plenty of things that the American Jewish establishment has done wrong. There's also plenty of things that it's done right, and I think that never comes up in the conversation. Things like, um, you know, all sorts of organizations, and I don't want to go into them because people here in the room represent some of them, but they've done great things. They've done great things in protecting Jews around the world. They've done great things in looking out for anti-Semitism in the United States and abroad. They've done great things in making sure that the non-sexy projects in various communities get funded. 
because they're not the ones that can go out there on the internet and raise their money themselves. The American Jewish establishment in the discourse of a certain part of the American Jewish community gets spoken about as if it's the big bad bear in the room. It's not. In other words, you can disagree with certain things that it did, and I agree with you, for example, that for a very long time, it shut down legitimate conversation about the conflict and about Palestinians. So the irony was, of course, that Israelis were having the conversation the whole time. Right? And then, but you couldn't have that conversation in America. That was ridiculous. That was a mistake. And I think everybody recognizes that the change came too late. But I think it's also important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think that the attack on birthright is a throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You misrepresented, I made one sentence, one sentence about Sheldon Adelson, and I said basically that you don't find him particularly appealing. I didn't say what I thought. But, um, but I never said that the reason that the change shouldn't take place was because of Sheldon. I said that the reason I thought it was going to be hard to make the change take place was because I think, again, if you want to say, well, there are Palestinians who think this and Palestinians who think that, to do that seriously, you need the five-day add-on. You actually need, the, you need exactly what Lauren does. No, no, I'm saying that 100% seriously. That's what you need. You can't do this as part of a 10-day trip because you are going to suck the air out of everything else that happens, and what they're going to end up coming back with is a very, very different kind of experience, which I think is going to be very, very problematic. Because here's another way in which I would look at everything that's going on between American Jews and Israel and the conflict and the Palestinians and all that. Number one, there's a great irony about the role of Israel in American Jewish discourse, which is that Israel is perhaps the most controversial topic in American Jewish life. There are lots of rabbis who will tell you that they will not speak about Israel from the pulpit, this is not an exaggeration. I think even the foreword has written about this. Um, there's a lot of rabbis who will, it's simply too dangerous. So we're in a world now where rabbis are too nervous about speaking about Israel to speak about that. The other subject, by the way, which I'm told outside the Orthodox community that you actually cannot talk about, is intermarriage. You know, those are, my, my friends in the, in, the, in the rabbinic world tell me that's also, you can't go there. So you can't talk about Israel, you can't talk about Israel. Believe intermarriage aside. You can't talk about Israel. The great irony about the fact that Israel is so controversial is if you take Israel out of the conversation, what is left that all American Jews actually care enough to talk about? Exactly nothing. Trump. No, no, no. I think that, no, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because Trump is not a Jewish issue. Right, right, right. Trump yeah. is an issue about the decency of American democracy right, and right. the decency of American civility. Right. And Jews care about that because they care about America. Right. It's not a Jewish issue. Yeah. And I think, by the way, that portraying Trump as the ally of Bibi mm -hmm. is a great disservice to Bibi, who I've never voted for and will not vote for in April. But Bibi is trying to navigate an uncharted and unchartable world in which the President of the United States does not know what he is going to say tomorrow quite literally. Mm -hmm. So you will move the embassy, you're the greatest friend of Israel, but you're going to take American troops out of Syria. But you didn't actually tell your generals you were going to take American troops out of Syria. You, you have an obligation to keep your country safe, and you don't know which way the winds are going to blow tomorrow. I actually think that given the fact that, and I'm not a fan, I'm not, you know that very well, I'm not a BB fan at all, I think he's done an actually admirable job of navigating these waters and keeping Israel's relationship with the United States from going down the, down the drain in really a very difficult thing, and I, I'm sure you saw, by the way, that Sippy Livni just said last week that settlement building under BB has been less than it had been under previous prime ministers. I don't know if you saw that, but it didn't get as much play as I thought it would, but it's a pretty extraordinary statement um, in many events. So the first thing is, I think, if you take Israel out, there's not a lot left that people really want to talk about. When I was in rabbinical school, Abraham Lincoln was president, when I was in rabbinical <laughs> school, um, it was difficult times in America, but, but People were very worried about continuity. Everybody was talking about continuity, but then we realized we weren't sure what it was that we wanted to continuate. So mm -hmm. we just stopped talking about continuity. <laughs> there was a big thing, you know, will you eat Triangle K? How do they build <laughs> those ships with the, the oil? And is it, nobody cares about Triangle K. It was a very big deal when you sit on a panel. No, seriously, you sit on a panel. If she's a rabbi, will the other people on the panel call her a rabbi? That was a big deal back in the 80s. Nobody cares. Call a rabbi, don't call him a rabbi. You want to do conversion that way, you do marriage that way. Nobody cares anymore. The only conversation that American Jews that are having about anything that's substantively Jewish is the conversation about Israel. But here's the other piece. The only conversation that we're having about Israel has to do with Israel's enemies in one shape, way, manner, or form. Think about the last 10 conversations, and this is probably an exceptional group in many different kinds of ways. 
you know, even though it's not Yale and it's not Columbia, it's still a good place. And, um, <laughs> oh, come on, get a life. But, um, <laughs> right, I mean, it's, it's, it's an exceptional group, so it's probably not as true of this. But most American Jews who actually have conversations about Israel, if you ask them how many of the last 10 conversations did not mention Arabs, occupation, Iran, Iraq, Hezbollah, Hamas, Syria, etc. There's not much left to talk about. And you actually said in a recent piece that the one piece of, Israel, of Israel's existence or impact that you would, that's not negotiable is it's being a refuge for Jews around the world. I actually think it's one of the least important pieces of Israel. It should be there. And God forbid there should, something should happen in Buenos Aires or Paris or Charlottesville or New York City. There should be a place for Jews to go. But Israel's not there for that. Israel's just not there for that. Israel is there because Israel is the place in which the Jewish people get to reimagine themselves as a people with responsibility for every dimension of society, from healthcare to borders, to freedom of the press, to treating minorities, including minorities who are opposed to your very existence, and so on and so forth. And I'll just point out, by the way, that it's a fascinating thing if you compare what's going on here and there, here you see who's declaring their candidacy for the Democratic Party, whatever. What's bubbling up in Israel is a center. Benny Gantz is a center, and Bogi Alon is a center, and Yair Lapid is a center. And in a poll that came out today, they said that if Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid get together, Meretz is wiped out. And it, and it, it competes basically neck and neck with the right wing flank. Israel's, Israel's not moving as much to the right as people pretend that it is. Um, there has not been any kind of charismatic leadership in the left or the center for a very long time. Benny Gantz seems to have some of the raw material that it may take to have that. And all of a sudden you see that Israelis are, are, are actually responding to that, not in the left, not on the right, but actually the center bubbling up. But I think we have having a conversation in America that's only about Israel, which is actually very sad, a Jewish conversation that's only about Israel, which is, again, back to your point, about the really, I mean, the evisceration of Jewish knowledge in this country, it's not sustainable. I think we all understand that. Let's just put it out there. This community is not sustainable. And I say that with no glee, but with the levels of Jewish knowledge and the kind of Jewish education, and those of you that went to Ramaz and SAR, that's not, that's not normal America. That's a tenth of a tenth. The levels of what most Jews in the world know, most Jews in the United States know, and now intermarriage, and now their kids, it's going to disappear. I say that with no glee, no satisfaction, tremendous sadness. This is the community in which I was raised. This is the community in which I was educated. This is the community that I thought I was going to work in until my wife informed me that I wasn't, and we were making Aliyah. But um, that's actually true. But, but, so I say that with no joy, but this is, this is a disaster scene. And the only thing that there's left to talk about is Israel. And when we talk about Israel, we're only talking about, we're only talking about the, the conflict. And I think that here, some of the left-leaning leadership bears a great responsibility for that. Let me just, let me just say this. Um, so I think, number one, if I disagree with you about something, it's I, I think that the, the attack on birthright is a mistake because it's a part of a larger attack on the establishment. Birthright is much better to have birthright as it is now without a single change than to destroy birthright by virtue of trying to actually force it to do things that it can't won't do or its funders won't do. It'll actually weaken and impoverish American Judaism even more than it is. The other thing that I'll just say, and this will probably take us into something where we completely disagree. Mm. I think this idea that the American Jewish establishment is the fundamental force behind the collapse of the two-state solution is it's, it's, it's a bit ludicrous. The reason that the two-state solution collapsed, and I, Israel's not sugar and spice and all things nice. It's not. And it, it knows how to drive a hard bargain, and not everybody in Israel is, in, you know, is the nicest person to agree with, and there are people that want to annex. It's all true. But fundamentally, the rise of this huge middle now, which is, which is, you know, which is going to compete with Bibi very significantly, is specifically talking about at least divorcing from the Palestinians distinctly anti-annexation. Benny Gantz has come out distinctly anti-annexation, and so on and so forth. A lot of Israelis aren't there to porch. What, what, why, why did this two states lose? I don't think it's dead, by the way. I really don't think it's dead. I don't think that any of us in this room are going to live to see it. I include the freshmen. No, I mean, seriously. You're not going to live to see a two-state solution, and you're not going to live to see peace. 
But it's going to happen eventually because neither people is going anywhere, and it's in the interests of both peoples. You could annex the entire West Bank, and it would still end up being two states eventually. Because, for reasons we can go into later. But I think to suggest that the responsibility for the two-state solutions being in the trouble that it's in is fundamentally Israel, or American Jews, or the American Jewish establishment just completely ignores the fact that when Oslo was signed, Palestinian terror skyrocketed. That before he was assassinated, Rabin apparently whispered to a few of his closest confidants, this may not be sustainable. We may have to pull out of Oslo. Bougie Alon says that. Other people have said that, that he said it to them. I wasn't there. I can't vouch for it. But I think it's really important to at least get the Palestinians to take some serious responsibility for the fact that to this very day, they actually have not acknowledged the right of the Jews to exist as a Jewish state to this very, very day. I mean, when, when um, uh, Barack Obama forced Bibi into this building freeze, if you recall, uh, he still couldn't get Abbas to come to the table. Abbas says, and now today they changed their tune a little bit, but for the last months and months they've been saying no matter what it is that Trump and Jared and Ivanka and Don Jr. and all of them bring to the table, Jason Greenblatt and a few other more serious people, um, Jason being among the serious ones, no matter what they bring, they're going to say no to it. I mean, that's where we're at. And so I think, again, I'm not suggesting that Israelis really, really play no role in this. They play some role in this. But the overwhelming responsibility for the reason that we have not made progress is because fundamentally the Palestinians turned down whatever deal Barack made, turned down whatever deal Olmert made. And you and I have hashed this before, and I know what you're going to say. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to listen politely. But, um, but I think that that's really very important. And I, I think, therefore, that the issue of birthright is are we better off with thousands and thousands and thousands of American Jews coming to Israel and seeing it? Yes. Is the Palestinian issue the most important thing to learn about Israel? No. The most important thing to learn about Israel is the rebirth of the Jewish people. The most important thing to learn about, the, about Israel is what happens when a people is situated in its own borders with responsibility for its own destiny, breathes new life into its once long, non-spoken language. I'll tell you where you get, and with this I'll stop. You get to the last time that the Man Booker International Prize finalists were announced about a year and a half ago, whenever it was. International Prize. Any book translated into English, which is hundreds of thousands of books. Of all of those books, there's five finalists. Two of the five were Israeli. One was Amos Oz, and one was David, one was David Grossman. And David Grossman won, Pursusa Hadnich Nasla Bar, A Horse Walks Into a, a Bar. I think it's called in English. That's an unbelievable thing for the Jews to be in that place. That's what Israel's about. Israel's about the Jewish people rejoining the international world of the commerce of ideas and culture and, and all of that. It's bringing the Jews back to being a real three-dimensional people in a very complicated region with tremendous pain, tremendous cost, but it's not about refuge. It's about the revitalization of the Jewish people. And I think, last sentence, with no subordinate clauses, mm -hmm. what you can actually see here is exactly the opposite trend. Israel is becoming a culture three-dimensional, made all the more rich by the way the Mizrahi tradition really seeping in much more than from the sidelines, but now becoming centrist because more than half of Israeli Jews are Mizrahi. And the erosion of that knowledge and that thickness of culture uh, on the American side. Again, a lot there. And uh, Daniel, you may know what Peter's going to say, but I imagine the rest of us in the room don't. So I can tell you. <laughs> um. <laughs> I'm not going to say what I was going to say, which is uh, <laughs> about why I think that um, uh, why I think that narrative that Israel offered the Palestinians everything they could have wanted in the Palestinians. I never said that. No, no, not say that's that. true. Fair enough. Okay. I, I would just say that if you look at actually some of the Israeli negotiators and uh, uh, some of Barack's top aides, for instance, um, uh, Gilad Sher, uh, Shlomo Ben Ami, a whole bunch of people, they would actually acknowledge that actually the Palestinians had their own offer at Camp David as well, which the Israelis rejected, just like the Israel rejected the Palestinian offer. And I would just say that since, if you want to fast forward to the Netanyahu era, right, I think it's virtually indisputable that Netanyahu has never accepted the Clinton parameters, the basic construction of the two-state solution that was the guide in the, for the Camp David negotiations in 2000, that actually uh, Abbas is much closer to within those parameters, if you look at everything from how long international troops were stayed in the Jordan Valley to the, to, to, the, to the solution of Jerusalem, to all these things, even including refugees, where he's at several, at several points acknowledged that there, that there would be a limit, a cap to the number of Palestinian refugees at perhaps 150,000 or so. So I think the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank at least is much closer to that Clinton parameters framework than, than Netanyahu. Netanyahu has never put any forward a single plan, as far as we know, 
for what his vision of a two-state solution is like. He doesn't even talk about supporting a two-state solution at all. The recently, we just got new, the Jerusalem Post has reported that of the 30 members of the Knesset who are from Likud, of the 30, 28 of them have signed a document saying they want to annex the West Bank. Right? Does that sound like a party that supports the two-state solution to you? It's been the party that's been in power now for a decade. But I think that that's kind of in the weeds. I mean, I think what, what Danny said that I wanted to, res what I really wanted to respond to was the way he, he framed the, the creation of the State of Israel and what it means. Um, as an, and, and he described it, I think, fundamentally as an accomplishment, maybe even as a miracle. And I would agree. It is an accomplishment, and I think it is a miracle. But what I felt was left out, maybe not that you would disagree, but what I think was left out from there, is that it's also a test. It's a test. The whole notion of you can't simply, again, I'm not saying Danny is doing this, but I feel like this is what I think happens a lot in the American Jewish community. You can't simply celebrate Jewish power without recognizing that Jewish power brings immense moral responsibilities and that the way you discharge those moral responsibilities, the responsibilities of governing over other people, has a said something very profound about the Jewish tradition itself, right? A Jewish tradition forged largely in in terms, of our, in, terms of our, in terms of our text, largely in exile, largely in powerlessness, with, a, with, with, a, with an extraordinary set of ideas about human dignity, which now can be tested by Jewish power in a way they never could, right? And I think what I feel like was not present in what Danny said is the reckoning with what happens if Israel fails that test. Because the novels may still be there and they may still be extraordinary. The food and the music may still be mouth-watering and extraordinary. The technology may be wizard-like. you know, wizard -like. But if you are permanently controlling millions of people whose situation, whose legal status, is worse than African Americans in Mississippi in the 1950s, because African Amer blacks in the segregated South were at least theoretically citizens of the country in which they lived, even though they could not actually take advantage of that citizenship by, for instance, being able to vote. Whereas Palestinians in the West Bank are not even theoretically citizens of the state that dominates almost every facet of their lives and has for more than a half century. If you make that permanent, it seems to me, you still have a miracle but it is a brutally tarnished miracle. And it is, and, and I have to say that for me, that is not a choice I want to have to make. That is not a combination I want to have to spend the rest of my life with. And we, and, and as, a, as just as a descriptive practical matter, because of the universalism of young American Jews, even if they do, and I, even if they do come to appreciate much of the extraordinary beauty and accomplishments of Israel, they are simply, they're not going to, I think, and we're seeing this with if not now and others, I think by and large, they will vote with their feet and they will say, the cost of this miracle is too high for me in terms of what I believe it means to be a Jew, right? Um, and um, and that's, the move, that's, that's the world we're moving towards. Um, and I would, I want to do everything in my power to stop that from being the choice we have to make. And it can only be stopped. Yes, the Palestinians can do all kinds of things differently, but we are not Palestinians, right? We have some influence here, right? And if you want to preserve the possibility of the two-state solution, preserving the two-state solution is preserving the possibility of a Jewish state that does not control millions of people whose legal status is worse than African Americans in Mississippi in 1953. If you want to create the possibility of that Jewish state existing, you have to stop settlement growth. In fact, you should do more. You should start paying Israeli Jews in the settlements, you should buy out their mortgages, and you should allow them to move back inside the Green Line. We should be raising money for that right now all over the, all over the United States in the diaspora, right? Because you can't simply say the two-state solution will always be there. It won't always be there. At some point, it just becomes impossible. There's not enough land on which to build a viable state, and you push the Palestinian national movement en masse into, 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 into one person, one vote, which is already where the younger generation is going. Um, so I, I, if you want to say that we can't have a two-state solution to tomorrow, you may be right. But what frustrates me to no end about 
uh, people to my right, maybe this is not true of Danny, but it's true, I feel like, of a certain discourse that exists in much of the American Jewish community, is they will not take the actions that would preserve the two-state solution, that would allow it to maintain. They pretend that we have a status quo when we don't have a status quo. Even if it's true that Sipi, it's what Sipi Livni said, that there's less settlement growth, according to statistics, that it was a piece in the AP just this month, the Israeli population grew at 1.9% in 2018. The settler population grew at 3.3%. Right? The movement that many Likud members of Knesset have just signed up for is, is, is says their goal is two million settlers in the West Bank. We have to do something about that. So I just want to respond. I actually agree with most of that. But there, there are a couple of things that, that trouble me about it. I'll try to say them very quickly. One is they're going to vote with their feet. Young American Jews are going to vote with their feet. Look, I agree with you that, that power is a test. And I think Israelis understand that power is a test. And I think there's a culture in Israel of power being a test, uh, a, a, a mistake-free culture, a culture without anything to be embarrassed about. Obviously not. You take enough 18-year-olds and give them weapons and put them in stressful situations for enough days on end, kids will do stupid things. Here they do them at frat parties <laughs> at 18. But there, they're at very different kinds of places. It doesn't make it OK. And Israel makes very bad choices at all different levels, but I think there's a very deep, deeply rooted culture of the responsibility of power in Israel. They're going to vote with their feet, you say. OK, but here's where Peter Beinart actually can do something about that. If your if you're call to the people who admire you, the ones who are quoting you and not me, are, um, you know, if your call to them, and this not this, in this particular case, obviously you're sitting here, so it's not the issue. But people, thousands and thousands of people read what you write, and thousands and thousands of people basically get a sense that it's a constant harp on Israel's not doing this right, and the American Jewish establishment is making that possible. What about the idea that Israel is a miracle? What about the idea that Israel has a deeply embedded tradition of power being a test? What about the idea that yes? The, 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 the occupation issue is all obviously critical, but there are many, many other things that Israel has accomplished. That's not spoken about enough by you and your other colleagues who represent this world, and I think you could balance the American Jewish discourse in a much more healthy kind of a way. That's the first point. The second point is this. Israelis, it's really important to watch this Benny Gantz phenomenon. I mean, this Benny Gantz phenomenon is a huge thing. Now, part of the reason, by the way, that a lot of American Jews are not watching the Benny Gantz phenomenon is because it's not in English. I mean, it's not in Hebrew, sorry. I mean, it's not in Hebrew. It's, no, it's it is not in Hebrew. In, it is not in English. It's not been translated from Hebrew into English. Benny Gantz's speech, whatever you think he meant, whatever you think he really said, it was a phenomenally interesting phenomenon in Israeli political life, maybe history, and 98% of American Jews have no access to it. That's a choice that American Jewish leaders made. American Jewish leaders made a choice not to have young American Jewish kids speak Hebrew. My parents are both New York natives. My parents, my father's no longer living, but my parents both grew up, one in Brooklyn and one in Far Rockaway, in Jewish speaking homes, in Hebrew speaking homes in the 1930s. In the 1930s and 1940s, they spoke not Yiddish, they spoke Hebrew. Now, there were, there were little Hebraist enclaves that didn't spread, uh, but in large measure, you can go actually to a very fine Orthodox high school in New York City or in Philadelphia or in Los Angeles or in Boston even, and leave after 12th grade, do you know 40 or 50 times 12 or 13, all the tuition that's paid, and not be able to actually read the front page of Haaretz. That's an abomination. It's a complete abomination. And that means that, therefore, this phenomenon that a new center is rising in Israel is happening completely off of the radar screens of most American Jews. And what's that center saying? That center is talking about not doing anything now that would preclude the possibility of a two-state solution down the road. That's what a guy named Amnon Reshef, who's the head of C uh, uh, Commanders for Israel's Security, the Fatim of Bichon Israel, which is, I don't know how many, 300, 700, I forget the number already, but hundreds and hundreds of people who are at commander level in the army and the police and the border police and so on and so forth, who are no longer in uniform, who therefore can take a political position, all of them saying, do not do any of that building out there that you're talking about, because we don't want to preclude that, but none of them saying, and we can end the occupation now. 
In other words, there's a way in which there's a complete, why is it that American Jewish leaders, young, old, establishment, non-establishment, campus, not campus, are having a conversation about end of the occupation now, if not now says that, J Street now says that, you say that sometimes, end the occupation, where virtually nobody in Israel, including merits and including labor, are having a conversation about ending the occupation now. Why is that? Because Israelis don't have the moral fortitude that American Jews have? Because the Israelis don't, you know, they didn't read enough, I don't know what, Aristotle or whatever. What's that? But they're not talking about, but first of all, Meretz is about to disappear completely. But the point, the vast majority of Israelis are having a conversation about how not to preclude the possibility of a two-state solution. There has been no discussion in any of this new party yeah, stuff about sure. ending it now. And I think the reason for that is the following. There is a very real, there's a very real physical danger there. This is the last point that I'm going to make about this. You put out a piece, this is not your fault at all. You put out a column in the, in the forward, I forget what it said, I'm sure I disagreed, but I, it, was, it was fine. <laughs> but the headline, which you did not write, it was after all the Palestinians were shot the day of the embassy move along the Gaza border. Sixty-something Palestinians were killed. You wrote a piece decrying that, that it was a human tragedy, to me, is unquestionable. The headline that you did not write, but was in the foreword, was this verbatim. Israel's decision to shoot Palestinians should not surprise us, but should still horrify us. It's not about me and Peter. That's about a sick accusation of a country that is defending a live border with lethal force as it always has, because the minute that fence comes down and people by the tens and then the hundreds and then the many hundreds start streaming across, then you're in a very bad situation in Shire, HaNegev, and in all kinds of other places where there's lots of people living. Israel's decision to shoot Palestinians, that's sick. It's sick. And it was kind of the, the newspaper of record in the American Jewish community that chose to put that headline out. And I want, yes, it's a horrible thing that 60 Palestinians got killed. It's also a horrible thing that the leaders of Hamas basically got them to go and attack the fence, while the leaders of Hamas themselves were sitting dozens and dozens of kilometers away, away from places that Israel could try to find them even if they wanted to. I want to ask you this. What about those 18 and 19 and 20 year olds who are on those big mounds of earth the young sharpshooters, who were ordered by their commanders to take shots when they had to. There were a few shots, I'm sure, that were taken that were not okay. And Israel's, Israel's investigating that, as well it should. But that fundamentally, those kids had to go home at night and get into bed. After seeing human beings in their sights, and being told that to make sure that fence doesn't come down, you actually have to pull that trigger now. And when the person falls down, you know you pulled the trigger. Do you think there's, there's anybody that takes joy in that? What happened, to the, what happened to the acknowledgement of the humanity of the kids that are in the green? Why is that vanished from here? And I think that's, that's the sickness of what has, and again, I'm, this is not about you specifically, but that's what's happened in America. Israel's, we can only talk about Israel because it's the only thing we care about. When we talk about Israel, it's only about the conflict. And when it's about the conflict, it's Israel's decision to shoot Palestinians. It's so unbelievably unfair that that's the reason the young American Jews are going to walk away. And the forward is not part of that American Jewish establishment. The forward is, publishes you and publishes many others who are actually opposed to the American Jewish establishment. It's not the AJC, and it's not the ADL, and it's not the UJ, not UJA, and it's not any of those other organizations that are getting young Jews to talk about Israeli soldiers choosing to shoot Palestinians. It's coming from the non-establishment, and it's doing infinitely more damage than the establishment might be doing. Um, can I? Can I quickly, very quickly? You can say something very quickly. I will say that when Peter was talking, I had a whisper in my ear saying, before we go to questions, just let me have one word. And then when Daniel was talking, I had a whisper uh, in my ear from Peter saying, just, just one word. And then we right. can so go to questions. So put your foot down so, and say no to um, So I'm going to be the dealer of time and say very, very quickly, because I know there's a lot of wisdom and curiosity in this room, and I would love to open it up to that. So yes, very quickly. Uh, let me try to say it in one or two sentences. I, would, I just want to note that when Danny was talking, saying nobody in Israel wants to end the occupation now, no Israelis, uh, uh, you, know, uh, Israel, you know, we don't think any Israelis have the moral fortitude, blah, blah, blah. He was, he was talking about Israeli Jews. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that, right? Because 20% of the population of Israel are Palestinians who would, who would emphatically like to end the occupation. Are, a lot of them would also like to end Israel, by the way. 
Uh, yes, and they also no, vote no, in Israel. No, they no, also, no, I mean, no, they, no, they, no, they would like it to be a second of our national state, that. right? My point is that this is precisely why I think it's so important for people to go on birthright and meet Palestinians, because we so casually erase Palestinians from this discourse. Almost every time I read a newspaper article, I hear people, I hear people talk about Israelis when they meet Israeli Jews. Right? And we would not be happy if people talked about Americans, if they only met white Americans. Right? This is part of the erasure of Palestinians that happens in the discourse in the American Jewish community. OK. With, with no whisper here, uh, I am going to say <laughs> that we have two student volunteers you heard from earlier, Sam and Jacob, who have microphones with them. Before we begin our question and answer, I would like to make a reminder to the audience that a question is a short clause. And at the <laughs> end of that clause, you will find a question mark not a period, not an exclamation point. Um, this is not a review of a dissertation. Please, I want to make sure that we have time for as many questions as possible. And the way that we're going to be able to do that is if we take two or three questions at once, we'll, we'll then break those down, give a little time for them, and move forward. And um, I'm also going to say that I would love to be able to prioritize student questions before we open it up to the broader community. And, uh, and with that, I'm curious about the thoughts, questions, and ideas in this room. Um, yes, speak of the mic and please introduce yourself uh, briefly before you ask your question. Hi, my name is Kara. Uh, I'm a junior in the college. And um, both of you talked about Jewish identity. Um, Dr. Gordis, you talked about how the, the, real, the real lesson from Israel is the bringing back of the Jewish people as a three-dimensional object or subject. And um, Mr. Beinart, you talked about uh, the rise of assimilation and the decline in Jewish identity. Um, and I had issues with both of those ideas in that I think that there's a lot of Judaism on the left in that, if not now, is reclaiming a lot of Jewish heritage. And I have a lot of friends who are anti-Zionist who create podcasts in Yiddish, and there's this reclamation of dias diasporic Jewish identity. Um, and I'm curious if you think that's good, bad, how does that net out for the Jewish community? Um, and Dr. Gordis, I don't know if the, the idea that we're bringing back some form of Judaism is accurate in that there's been thousands of years of Jewish history that existed without a Jewish state. Um, and I believe that's, I think, I, I would be curious how you feel about the authenticity of that form of Judaism. And if this Which is form? of the, the post-Zionist or current Zionist era, um, comparatively to the pre-Zionist Jewish past. We're gonna take two more and then we'll answer questions. Hi, um, I'm Andy, I'm a graduate student at the university. Uh, sort of related, my question is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the question of how Israel and like the Israeli religious sort of control of social function and marriage will be an issue as Jews in America intermarry and while, you know, Israeli immigration law allows people, you know, who have uh, at least one grandparent to migrate to Israel as Jews, how if the more religious areas of um, Israel sort of control who is considered a Jew in the social sphere, if that will continue to cause the separation outside of the Israel-Palestinian issue. I've heard some people say that is one of the biggest issues in the split. Uh, hello, my name is Ben, and I'm a very grateful community member of Cambridge, not a student. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, my, my questions for you specifically, Mr. Beinart. Um, how do we explain or justify um, the active lobbying of some American groups, like let's say J Street, that directly oppose or contradict Israeli interests? For example, with the Iran deal, um, if I'm not mistaken, J Street did actively lobby the um, advancement of the JCPOA, even though Israelis were largely opposed to the deal. So how do we justify or even explain that, grapple with it? Thank you. Let's go for it. Okay, so um, I have the, well, the last question. Um, I can even help people out with the last question. Israelis were, were more split than the question suggests, but I, I think your question is very well in place, so, but acknowledge that they were more split. That way, has to answer the harder part of the question. Okay, um, but I won't answer that one because it wasn't to me. Look, I, I don't think it's for anybody to judge the authenticity of post-Zionism. Of post I, I think that, that, I don't think anybody ought to judge the authenticity of anybody else's Judaism. Uh, I think you can't judge the authenticity of something except by the question of whether it can perpetuate itself. That's the ultimate, that's the ultimate test. And you should really ask yourselves what forms of Judaism in the world today are perpetuating themselves 
And what forms of Judaism of the world today are not perpetuating themselves? What forms of Judaism over the last 200 years, since the, more or less, give or take, since the Haskalah, uh, have managed to somehow survive? And obviously the Shoah screwed up the experiment in large ways. We won't know what would have been otherwise, obviously. But my objection to post-Zionism uh, is not its authenticity. It's not the word that I would have used. My objection to post-Zionism, and I just disagree with it. I don't think it should not be allowed to exist. I think that in a that I think that in an open society, post-Zionists have every right to do what they want to do, and I have every right to say, well, I think they're wrong. And I think that what we have to get to is exactly what, what we're modeling here tonight, which is to say, we disagree about a lot of things, but you can talk to each other like you're two human beings who actually care about things that matter, and, it, and if that's the only thing that comes out of an evening like this, I think it's very worth it. Um, my objection to post-Zionism is that I think that the, the creation of the State of Israel is the most extraordinary thing that's happened to the Jewish people in the last 2,000 years. And it's the most important thing, even more important than the Holocaust. Not minimizing the Holocaust. But it's the most important thing that the Jewish people have managed to create, do, whatever that's happened to the Jewish people in the last 2,000 years. My own view is that people that don't see that, that don't understand that, have a myopic view of Jewish history, have allowed their own universalist commitments to trump their Jewish, I don't use the word tribal, Peter, but these particularists, have allowed their, their own universalist commitments to trump, bad word, to overtake, their, to overtake their particularist commitments. I disagree profoundly with that read. I don't think it's inauthentic. Just disagree with it. I think it's a misread of what's been grand about Jewish history in the last two millennia. Um, so that's my objection to it. I also think, by the way, that if you think that the most extraordinary thing that's happened to the Jews uh, is, the, is the creation of the State of Israel, and you don't understand this if you're in college now, but you walk around campus here with the self-confidence that enables you to criticize Israel because of the self-confidence that you have because of Israel. <laughs> Talk to your grandparents about what it was like in America in the 1940s and the 1950s and the early 1960s before the 67 war. They didn't walk around like that. People did not walk into Wall Street firms wearing a kippah, saying, here's my CV, and by the way, my, my People has 482 holidays a year, and I leave at nine, you know, and I leave at 9:30 in the morning on Fridays, and I can't come back till Tuesday, you know. And I want to start with a corner office. I'm obviously exaggerating, but when I was in college, it wasn't all that long ago. I know you think like I'm ancient; they're gonna bring out oxygen any second. But when I was in college, people with Keep Hope were just starting to get those interviews in Wall Street and in Madison Avenue. What transformed everything was Israel. The problem of the younger generation is it, with no fault of its own, it just doesn't know that. It doesn't understand how Israel has been key to the very self-confidence that they have that they employ to then criticize Israel. So I don't think it's about, it's about um, the authenticity of post-Zionism. I simply think that post-Zionism is a radical, tragic, errant misread of Jewish history. They have every right to promulgate their view, and I have every responsibility to try to object. In terms of intermarriage and the rabbinate, um, look, I mean, my daughter is sitting in the room, and I'm a non-Orthodox rabbi, and I did her wedding in Israel, um, and she and her then fiancé did all this investigation, talking to this person and that person. They thought they had the whole system figured out. At the end of the day, it didn't work, um, and they decided, they had a whole idea. It didn't end up happening. They come to me, you know it's illegal, you can go to jail, will you do the wedding? And yes, and I'm going to do my son's wedding, God willing, in a few months in Israel too, and I could, like that Haifa rabbi, you know, get, get taken off to jail in the morning. And as far as I'm concerned, if there's no faculty meetings and there is Wi-Fi, I'm in. You know, basically <laughs> just um, give me a six-month sentence. I got a lot of email to catch up on. But much more seriously, I'm opposed, I'm opposed to the rabbinate's control. I'm opposed to the rabbinate's control of, of religion in Israel because, first of all, it turns off secular Israel. Secular is a complete misnomer. Those secular Israelis, 90% of whom fast on Yom Kippur, the 80-something percent of whom light Hanukkah candles every single night, some overwhelming percentage of whom have a Pesach Seder, that kind of secularism I can actually live with. So secular is a bad word, but we'll just use it for a nomenclature right now. The, my problem with the rabbinate is twofold. Number one, aside from its you know, dishonesty and misogyny and racism and all of that, <laughs> it's that, it's that it, it is promulgating a variety of Judaism which I think is a... Is a bastardization of the greatness of what Judaism is. And therefore the tragedy of the state of Israel is that very often Israelis need to come to Boston as part of the Wexner program or as part of some other program, be here for a number of months, go to a reform synagogue, go to a conservative synagogue, go to a modern orthodox synagogue and say, oh my God, there's that? 
and then come back to Israel and start looking for places which, of which there are more and more and more. That's my first objection to, to the rabbinate there, that it's just, it's promulgating a variety of Judaism, which is Judaism not nearly at its best, and the Jews in Israel deserve better than that. My other objection to it is that I think, um, well, let's leave it at that for now. Now, the only other point that I'll make now, what's the, relation, what's the impact of that on American Jews and their attitudes to Israel? Virtually zero. Let's be honest. The number of people in America who are intermarried who want to make Aliyah but who won't make Aliyah because Misrada Datot will not rep- recognize their marriage, they could all fit in the empty seats of this front row. No, it's not okay what's happening there. And the derisive, dismissive, insulting language that comes out of the chief rabbinate is horrendous, and it's got to stop. I actually think that the chief rabbis of Israel ought to be people who went to college and whose children go to the army and who will eat in the restaurants that get state hashkacha. <laughs> Just, there's three things that don't happen. Okay, so I think it's, it's horrifying for all sorts of reasons, but it's not at all the reason that people who are intermarried feel a greater distance from Israel. They got intermarried because they fell in love with somebody who wasn't Jewish. They decided to spend their lives together. And that's fine. But that's not the issue. It has nothing to do with the relationship to Israel, the whole chief rabbinate thing. Peter, before you, yes. before you start, yes. I want to make sure that we also get to a next round of questions. So I'm yes. going to ask you to give a bit of a shorter answer sure. there, and then I'll let you start. Uh, the next time around. Sure, sure, sure. First of all, just Danny, just as uh, you know, on the question of what it's like, what the Wi-Fi is like in jail. I was detained by the in Israel for the, uh, for, for for a little while, and the Wi-Fi was so-so. But um, uh, um, uh, much to my kids' chagrin. Um, the um, uh, on the question of J Street, uh, look, J Street has the right to lobby uh, the American government in favor of the uh, Iran deal. First, first of all, because J Street is a group of Americans. Um, who believe, and I think they were right, that um, an Iran deal was, a, was, a one, was the best way of us preventing another war uh, uh, in the Middle East, which would have been bad for America. Um, uh, and secondly, because Isra- J Street has the right, to, does not have to take a poll to determine what it thinks is best for Israel. Just indeed, as Israel doesn't have to take a poll of Americans or American Jews. Israel lobbied against the Iran deal in Washington, despite the fact that polls showed that American Jews and Americans supported it, right? That is to say, both groups of people have the right to follow their conscience. They can be wrong, but they have the right to follow their conscience about what they think is right. Um, on this question, of, if not now, I, I, um, I think that um, if not now is a group that is made up of people, and I think its critics sometimes don't understand this, of, of, of those American Jews who really care, right? Which is to say that the, the kids in If Not Now, by and large, tend to have a much thicker Jewish identity than your average non-Orthodox American Jewish kid. They're kids who went to day school and went to Camp Ramah and whose parents are non-Orthodox rabbis. And uh, they, they, they are the ones who care, right? Which is part of the reason I think that they're really important and why they're really important, you are really important, not only for the changes you make in Israel, which and I hope you do, but also for what you do in terms of American Jewish life and American Jewish culture. Right? Um, which is why I think, and I think the best parallel is, is a group like Brera in the early 1970s, which was a group that was about a policy towards Israel, but also about American Jewish renewal. I think, if not now, needs to create uh, its own Haggadah, its own bencher, its own Siddur. It needs to start producing things in, American, in the American Jewish religious and cultural space for millennials. Right? Um, and I think that will be one of its greatest contributions. You know? Um, and so if Myth Not Now is a diasporic group, it believes deeply, I think, in diasporic Jewish identity, and it has to take upon itself the obligation of making sure that it is part of what preserves that, you know, by, by, by thickening it and creating something that is transferable to the generation below you. Um, I, I guess the, the, um, the only th- last thing I would just say is that, I first, I don't think it's, I don't think it's entirely fair, true to say that American Jewish self-confidence is the creation of the state of Israel. It is partly because of, of the success of the state of Israel, but Italian Americans are also more self-confident than they were in the 1960s because they're more privileged, they're more fully excluded, excluded ex, you know, expected, they're further away from their immigration, right? Israel is only one of the reasons that American Jews have that sometimes somewhat annoying increased self-confidence, right? It's also because of they're more fully, fully integrated into the American experiment than they were. And the, then the last one, very quickly, is Danny said something about how you can judge something Jewishly by its perpetuation, or something along the lines. 
I think you can partly judge its value based on the perpetuation. But I just think I don't want to, we shouldn't take this too far. If that's the only standard, then the Haredim are, then by de, they win, right? They're the best at perpetuating, right? It's not only, it's not only perpetuating the number of Jews, right? Or even, or even the number of mitzvot that those Jews do. To me, again, and this is my universalism, it also has to do with your larger values in terms of how you treat the whole world. All right, let's get three more questions. Two or three, I'll let you two choose. Hi, I'm Avi, um, also a community member. Um, so I'm just sort of going back to your debate and trying to think about the differences that were emerging and I'm trying to just characterize it in my mind so either of you can respond or both um, if this is accurate, but it seems like Danny, you're thinking more in terms of the long term, like Israel, Palestine, two state solution is gonna be here. It's not, go neither people are going anywhere. So you're thinking long term. Whereas Peter, you're thinking more immediate, like this is a crisis, this is gonna collapse, this is gonna explode. So because of that, we need to be talking about the Palestinian issue. Whereas you're thinking long term, we need to be thinking about like the American Jewish community and Jewish commitment. Um, would that be a correct way to characterize the difference between you two? And if we can get one more question, we'll go with one more. Do we have any students who have a question? Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. My name is Sarah, I'm a Wexner Fellow. I'm also a NITREC leader for this next merge. So we have lots of experiences this year. And my question is for you as important leaders in the Jewish community uh, of America. Um, if you had to, to put numbers, what is the most important thing for American Jews now, from one to 10, to deal with their Jewish identity and to strengthen it, as you were talking about the problem of ignorance, or to deal with the um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Put numbers from one to 10, and what should be done regarding your priorities. Thank you. All right, and. You said you could go first. I, I did indeed. We are unfortunately, I think, running too short on time. And because of that, I'm gonna ask for both of you to do as short of an answer as you can, given that those were very uh, deep and, and wide reaching questions, both of them. I don't think the difference between Danny is that, and Danny and I is that one of us cares about the long term, one of us cares about the short term. I think the difference is that Danny is more confident that the two station, two state solution will essentially be there one day, essentially kind of almost irregardless of what Israel does, or at least he, Israel can continue on its current path. I don't think so. I think what will happen is that sooner or later the Palestinian Authority is going to collapse. It has no legitimacy. It was not meant to be Israel's permanent subcontractor in the West Bank. Its only legitimacy was to be the embryo of a Palestinian state. When it collapses, then the, Israel has to go back to directly occupying the West Bank, its own 7, 18 and 19 year olds in every Palestinian village and town. And I also think that the, the kind of whole structure of the two state solution, which is held in place by the PA as the embryo of the Palestinian state collapses. And I think we move much more explicitly, both uh, in, among the Palestinians and in the United States into a one state discourse. And once the one state discourse takes hold in the Democratic Party, it will, uh, it will um, be wildfire. It, will be, it is entirely natural for progressive liberal Americans to, to, to support the idea of one secular state rather than two states that try to provide two ethno-nationalist states. And once that becomes sayable in the American political discourse, it will become hegemonic on the left and inside the Democratic Party, and I think that could happen within five years, within 10 years, within one year. Um, uh, in terms of the two priorities, I, I don't want to have to choose. Um, I don't think one has to choose. I mean, there's no question that part of the distancing of American Jews to Israel, probably the single biggest factor, is lack of Jewish identity, is the lack of strength of Jewish identity. But there is also evidence now we see that even if you hold Jewish identity constant, you see that political alienation also plays a role as well. So if I had to put a number of it, I would say that, you know, Fighting for liberal democracy uh, and uh, in the state of Israel, I would put that at 10. And uh, fighting for Jewish education, I'd put that at 11. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to start right where you left off. Israel's not a liberal democracy. It was never meant to be a liberal democracy. 
It's made it very clear what the Balfour Declaration said, His Majesty's government looks with favor, favor misspelled, but okay. His Majesty's government looks with favor upon the creation in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. A national home for the Jewish Without, people. Without, right, there's another part of that. Correct, but it's a national home for the Jewish people. Without prejudice. Right, Agreed. to the rights of the of right of the non-Jewish citizens. Understood. And when the and when the partition plan came in 1947, it was a creation of a Jewish state and an Arab state. Had they actually accepted that, there would either there probably or might be at least a Jewish state and an Arab state. Israel was always meant to be a Jewish state. To talk about Israel as a liberal democracy in the in the sort of Lockean, Jeffersonian, Hamiltonian tradition. Only one got a musical, but one can always hope, right? <laughs> To talk about Israel as a liberal democracy in that tradition is to misunderstand what Israel is. It is not America speaking Hebrew, eating falafel. It's not. It is a, it is a country which is a very different model, which puts one particular ethnicity, one particular people, one particular tribe, one particular religion at the very center of its purpose for being. That's why I want there to be a Palestinian state. I want there to be a Palestinian state for the very same reason that I live in Israel. When I had Mrs. Brown in seventh grade, this is serious. When I had Mrs. Brown, she was the scariest teacher I ever had. But when I had Mrs. Brown in seventh grade for social studies, and she taught us about George Washington crossing the frozen Delaware, and we learned about the Alamo, and we learned about Fort McHenry, it was fascinating, and I was this little kid, and it didn't feel like my story. My ancestors were not on the Mayflower. America's been great to the Jews. But for some reason that I cannot articulate, the stories that Mrs. Brown incredibly effectively taught us didn't feel like mine. And when I drive up the highway from Tel Aviv or the airport to Yerushalayim, and there's the memorial to Yitzhak, well, the, the port seam, the people that broke through to Jerusalem. When I was a little kid, and my parents took us there when I was 10 years old, felt like my story. I want Palestinians to have the same possibility. I want them to have a country in which their culture is central, in which their language is central, in which their sense, their narrative is central. I'm not a, I'm not a two-stater because I'm a tzaddik. I'm a two-stater because I think it's actually good for Israel not to have people living in it who don't want to be there. Any Arab who lives there who wants to stay there, fine. But there are people for whom their own personal narrative leads them to want to live in a place which is formed around that narrative. That's what Israel is for Jews. That's what Palestine, I hope, can be for Palestinians one day. Israel's not a liberal democracy. And when we say that we want to try to do is bring liberal democracy to Israel, what we're destroying is the very essence of what Israel was meant to be. So I think it's great that you said that because I think it's really an important distinction. The, so I'll leave that. Uh, one last point and then one very quick story. I think that, no, Jews tell stories. That's how we should close things. Jews tell stories. Purim, Purim's coming up, we're going to tell a story. Ah. Pesach's coming up, we're going to tell a story. Jews, I mean, seriously. Quick Judaism story. is a a telling story. story. A very quick a very story. story. Once upon like a time. A Snapchat yeah. story. A Snapchat for the, story. For the millennials out there. Right, right. right. Keep your groggers think, in your pockets, please. I think that, um, <laughs> I think that, the, that the, the, the literacy piece is infinitely more important than the conflict piece. Because Judaism fundamentally is a tradition that is deeply rich and very unkind to people that don't know it. It's just not. How many young American Jews growing up understand that Judaism is as rich and deep and three-dimensional a culture as Western civilization? With as many great books, with as many great thinkers, with as many profound ideas, they have no sense. They don't know what a mission is. They don't know what a is. They can't tell you the difference. They don't know who Maimonides was. They, if you don't know any of that, then really, as Peter said before, you're reduced to locks and bagels, and you can understand why people walk away. My sense is that if you know this, I don't care what you dive in or don't dive in or eat or don't eat, who you marry, I don't care. But I think if you, un if you knew this tradition inside out, you would want to be part of it for the rest of your life, and you would want your family to be part of it, and then you'd figure out where Israel fit into it. So for me, I would put literacy at 10, and the other one much below her. Very quickly, 1948, Ben-Gurion tells stu uh, soldiers in the Negev, Tell soldiers in the Negev, you got to hold on to this little place called Eilat. It wasn't in the partition plan. It's not ours right now. We got it. You got to hold on. Everything that can go wrong goes wrong. The pipes, the water pipes, predicting them water are destroyed. They run out of food. They run out of ammunition. Israel has no airplanes to protect them. They're getting schmeist. But they've been told they can't have been in the position, but they, they just don't know what to do. They actually, four of them or five of them, this was told, by the way, to Chaim Guri by Samach Yizhar, two of Israel's great novelists, and Guri wrote it in a, in a, in a diary. 
They made their way to Tel Aviv. And they actually walked in, amazingly enough, back in the day, they just walked into Ben-Gurion's office. And they said, you know what, you told us to hold on to it, you don't understand what's going on down there. There's no water, there's no food, there's no communications, you have no airplanes to protect us, we have no artillery, we're out of ammunition, what are you talking about? And Ben-Gurion was silent. And for a minute they thought he'd just lost it. And finally he said, a lot is going to be the port to which ships are going to come from all over Africa. And then a lot's going to be an even greater deep, city, deep water port. And ships are going to come to Israel from all over the world. A lot is going to be the place that Israel meets the world. And he went like this. Get out. He didn't tell them that it was going to be OK, that they would be OK. He just told them, you can't make this thing work unless it's about a really big dream. My worry about the discourse about Israel in America is that it has eviscerated the conversation about grand dreams. It is a miracle. It's a flawed miracle. It has many challenges. But I think our responsibility as people who write and people who speak and as people who, some people quote us here and there, is a responsibility more than anything else to inspire them with a sense of the grandeur of what's been accomplished and to leave them with a hope that if we work together, we can make even greater things happen in the future. You're all going to have to clap again in just one moment, because yeah. even though we've gone over time, uh, one thing that I would love both of you to share, really one sentence. I know you're on Twitter, so 140 mm. characters mm. to the best of your ability of. Um, Did they increase it? They increased it, no? Yeah. Uh, 280. I don't have a Twitter. I'm still on Facebook. I'll try to be I, nicer than people I recently on learned it's not cool to be on Facebook, but that is where most of my social media lives, so I didn't know that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll get a Twitter now that I know I have more I can say. Now that it's 280, Germans can write a full sentence. <laughs> 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 um, in a tweet length form, uh, I want to come back to, to something that I wanted to mention in the beginning, which is that you two both have a podcast. It's called Fault Lines. And at the beginning, you talk about the importance of having discourse uh, across the fault lines, across the aisle. And especially, I think, for a community like a campus community where often we are in siloed politics, I would love if each of you could very, very briefly offer one sentence of advice or guidance to a community um, that is trying to explore what it means to have a dialogue among different uh, opinions and what it means to build community across difference. I've stumped him. I did it. Um. OK, so I'll go. <laughs> Seriously, two things. One is, I would say, epistemological humility. To be a yodea she'eno yodea. To acknowledge how much not every single one of us doesn't know. Instead of pretending that we know the answers, what if we acknowledge all things we didn't know? We'd have a very different conversation. Stop with that. I agree with that. I just add that um, we are one people, um, and I believe that our fate as Jews is fundamentally intertwined with one another. Um, and I believe that we, sh we should argue fiercely and we should feel commitments to, to non-Jews, especially to Palestinians, but we should always recognize that at the end of the day, just as those people in our own families infuriate us, um, we need, we come back to them at the end of the day because we know that at the end of the day, they're the people who'll take, who, will, who will take us in. They're the people who we may need to rely on. They're the people that we share things so fundamental that we can't express them. And that for people, and, and I say this, you know, especially I think people on the Jewish left need to hear this, that that's the way that we on the Jewish left should see everybody else in the Jewish community.
with that, I would like to offer a big thank you to Jonah for a beautiful introduction, to both Jacob and Samantha for working tirelessly to make this happen. It is not easy to be a student on this campus and on top of a full course load try to pull together a really large event of this size. To both of these wonderful people, I never in a million years would have dreamed that I'd be able to sit at a table with you and ask you questions. Um, this has been so wow amazing. And to all of you for all of the wisdom, knowledge, and open ears that you've brought. Um, and also thank you to the Harvard Bookstore, which is outside right now with uh, copies of Daniel's recent book. And I hope my ask, my one big ask, is that everyone in this room, I imagine, has heard something that has resonated and has heard something that makes you want to clench your fists or throw a, a Bic pen or something to that degree, and that you find someone who disagrees with you and that you get in a meaningful conversation with them so that this becomes not only a conversation from tonight, but a model of what our community can look like as we move forward. So thank you very much.